I have no idea why we bought this place. I had never had a single thought about a resort, but my new wife and I stumbled upon this place by chance. It was early autumn. The heat was incredible. We came around the corner, and I saw a big sign that said, Cold Beer. At the time, I was just over 19, and I decided that my gift of gab might help me get one. Hell, I spent time in most of the taverns around the town we lived in without anyone asking me for ID. I think the mustache I wore at the time helped. I pulled into a gravel parking lot that was bordered by pine logs sitting on short stumps. Everything I could see was made of pine logs. We were in the middle of what was basically eastern Oregon. I guess in those days they built with logs or didn't build at all. We went inside. It was cooler there. There was no one in the establishment except for a decrepit old man behind the bar. Everything there was made of logs, varnished and shiny. It actually looked quite nice. You look like you could use a cold beer, he grinned. Fine, I replied as he placed two cold brown bottles on the bar counter. I paid him and Sharon and I sat down and took a few sips. So what if I was barely 19 and Sharon was 18? I doubted he cared. What the hell? 75 miles from everything, there are no cops around and there probably won't be any. I kept an eye on the gas gauge on our almost new 1964 Impala. It was a gorgeous super sport model. It was dark red, had white bucket seats, had a huge V8 engine, and drank gasoline like water. I knew we had about 30 miles to go before we'd have to turn back if we couldn't find a gas station. Here, on the edge of the Oregon desert, it was mostly sage scrub and rocks. We drove along the river, and if it made a bend, then the road also made a bend. This seemed strange to me. They could drive straight as fast as they could, and the only thing they would have to move was a jackrabbit or two. The old fart kept staring at Sharon, which made me chuckle. But I can't say I blamed him. She was only 145 centimeters tall, and weighed 43 kilograms on a good day, but she was young and slender and had breasts that would put most large women to shame. Sharon was one of those women that we all see from time to time. She liked to be looked at and liked to show off her assets. At that period of her life, Sharon really had something to brag about. Plus, like I said, it was damn hot. So she was only wearing a tiny mini skirt and a halter neck top with a hell of a lot of Sharon sticking out of it. She had been like this since the day we met. When most women still wore one-piece swimsuits to the beach, Sharon was already wearing two-piece outfits, conservative by today's standards, but almost scandalous in those days. She also did not have underwear, which was passed down from her mother, who believed that underwear caused illness. It immediately struck me that Sharon's mother was the same. She happily sat opposite me in the living room, and many times I could look right under her dress. That's how I found out that she never wore anything under her dress. Sharon got a lot of looks, but I didn't mind at all. So, what the hell are you kids doing here? Asked the old man, pouring himself another beer, and his eyes turned again to my beautiful young wife. We're on our honeymoon. We're just sightseeing. I was looking for a place to catch fish. Oh, honeymoon, huh? This is great. You are a cute couple. I know you're both underage, but I don't care. The cops never came here, and they don't care, so enjoy. Fish, right? There's a lot of it over there in the river. Look around as much as you want. Backyard pond with brook trout. Catch some if you like. We were glad to be inside and out of the heat, so that's what we did. Sharon sat on a high stool and showed no signs of wanting to move. She was not at all interested in fishing. I walked out to the pond and, in the blink of an eye, half a dozen small trout, 25 centimeters long, grabbed my fly. It was fun. I just let them go. Then I got too hot again and went back to the house. Sharon pressed her belly against the bar, chatting enthusiastically with the old man. He looked at me, grinned, and went back to looking at her top. He made no effort to be cunning. I was sure the old man glanced at her large breasts from time to time, but Sharon, I knew, didn't mind. She had learned early on that men like breasts, so she made sure to show them off. I had no reason to be upset or worried. I had seen both of them before I even knew her name. Another thing I quickly discovered when we started dating was that I could look at her big breasts, touch them, play with them, but nothing more. But she wouldn't let me have sex with her for anything in the world. It was for the one she would marry. 
Sharon was a virgin on our wedding night. Of that, I was completely sure. We made one hell of a mess. She was amazing, and she knew it. It was damn obvious that the old man was getting great pleasure from this. There was a huge pool table there, so I pulled her away from the bar, and we went there and played a few games. I enjoyed watching Sharon rise on her tiptoes to reach some of the distant balls. I looked at the old cat. He was also watching carefully. Like I said, I couldn't blame him. Sharon was a pleasure to look at, and the bottom half of her ass would peek out every now and then. Of course, she was fully aware of this, because every time she did something like that, she would get hot as a pistol, and as soon as we were alone, she would start hunting me. I knew damn well that there was nothing extra on her mind right now, because just an hour or two earlier, we had completely explored the deserted campsite we found by the creek. The old man looked at her curly black hair as she stretched to take a longer shot. I sat waiting between each shot and could see everything there, so I knew he could too. I walked up to the bar and ordered another one. Of course, at my expense. He grinned and took out a couple more bottles of ice. How do you manage to keep beer so cold? I knew there were no power lines here. I drive up the mountain and remove snow and ice in my truck. He grinned, pretending to wipe down the bar. It helps keep things cool here, too. He waved his hand towards the large wooden door, which was open half a meter. Through the slightly open door, I could see a large pile of snow inside. The generator in the backyard helps keep it going, but about 4.5 degrees is the coldest I can get there. At night, I turn off the generator and just open the outside doors. Almost everything freezes here at night. I looked around. The room was large. Everything was made of logs. Literally everything was made of logs. Even the railings were made of thin logs. Someone had drilled them and made pegs. They seemed simply driven in. It fascinated me. I spent a long time looking at how it was all put together. I even reached down and felt one of the dowels. It looked like there was some kind of glue on them, and the dowel itself was clearly planned. There was no machine. Peg, exclaimed the old man, watching me closely. There's not a single nail here, but the pegs last longer anyway. I just coat the pegs with clay and then a clear stain. I have five gallons in a bucket in my shed. I nodded, stood up, and walked over to carefully inspect the walls. Each log was aligned top and bottom and fitted so close that there was not the slightest gap. There is no need for insulation, and there is nowhere to put it. For some reason, it actually looked neat. Hey guys, are you going to stay? We have six rooms upstairs. We have camping equipment and we don't have much money, I told him. It was true, I had about $60 left in my pants pocket. Oh, what the hell? At my expense, there is no one else here anyway, and there won't be. Not at this time of year. Isn't business good? I asked, just to keep the conversation going. The whole summer is good, and then, when bad weather comes, no one shows up. Such hot weather at this time is a surprise. People have all already left. The kids are at school, probably. Life here is calm. I go hunting for meat for the winter. The river is full of fish. I've lived and run this place for 35 years. I have three campsites down the road, 15 acres of land, and it's all on the beach. I'm trying to sell. Why sell? I ask it. I'm already old and want to retire. It's time for a young guy like you to take over and make something out of this place. I laughed. I have no idea how to run a campsite and a bar. I had no idea when I bought this place either. Now I have a deal with a large company from the north, city people, but I don't want to sell to them. They'll probably have to. They'll ruin everything here. They'll put up signs, won't let everyone else in, and we'll use it for big shots. I'm going to hate this. We both looked at Sharon. She was standing and looking out the window. He caught my eye and grinned. Damn, I wish I was 20 again. He grinned at me. I grinned back and Sharon turned and walked towards us, her large breasts swaying slightly as she walked. Hey, honey, do you want to buy a resort? I asked her, mostly teasing. What? She looked at me in surprise, as if she thought I was serious. This place is for sale. Camping, fishing, bar, restaurant, rentals, you name it. How many? She asked. Fifteen thousand for the campsite. Others have offered seventeen. But I would prefer that young guys like you take over it, rather than this corporation. For the rest, 
I need fifty dollars an acre. The old man inserted this word and looked at her expectantly. Fifty dollars an acre for desert land? No way in the world, I thought. There is nothing there but dirt and stones. Even the road is just a dirt track. But then, there was water. This river in front of the house, bushes along it and some pine trees. So maybe, however, we had about a hundred dollars in the bank, so I laughed about it. My job at the mill paid one to while on six, six, six an hour. It would have taken me 25 years to save up that amount. I knew that land in the desert was worth almost nothing. I bet we can borrow that much from my Uncle Henry. He owns a stone quarry on the coast. Sharon smiled at me. You're kidding, I told her. No, I'm not joking. It's very nice here. I like it. Your mill has no future. She looked at me as if she expected me to jump at the chance. Actually, I wasn't very happy about this idea. Bend is only 80 miles from here, she said, looking into his eyes with a distant look. Total? I knew Sharon well enough to know what she was thinking. For example, when we bought an Impala, the old DeSoto I had before had a bad habit of breaking down every two or three days. She said I was spending more on parts than on payments for a new car, so we bought it. We'll spend more on a house there on the coast, she added. I thought about a small trailer, 2.4 meters wide by 12.8 meters, that we bought for just under a thousand dollars in payments. She was right. We looked at several houses, all in the $13,900 to $17,900 range. It was just unreal. I sat there and wondered, damn. She suddenly became serious. Did she really think about us spending $15,000 on a house in the middle of nowhere? Besides, you like to fish and hunt. She turned to the old man, who was now grinning from ear to ear. Come on, honey, I'll show you around. You talk like you have a good head on your shoulders. He placed his hand on the small of her back and guided her towards the back of the house. I snorted, figuring he just wanted to gawk at her a little longer. Help yourself to another beer if you want. He grinned at me over his shoulder. That's exactly what I did. Then I looked into the kitchen. There was a huge grill, and through a hole in the logs there were wires running to where I saw a couple of large propane tanks. Also, there was wood stacked there, so it obviously ran on either gas or wood. They were digging through the refrigerator, and I noticed that the old man kept reaching out and putting his hand on Sharon's bare waist to guide her. I didn't care, but she didn't seem to mind. In any case, I began to gradually come to my senses from the beer I drank. The refrigerator was just a room with a trash can, and there were big double doors in the back that opened, and I guess he was shoveling snow in there. There were boxes of beer there. I went over to look at the stairs. The steps were logs cut in half and placed flat side up. It all looked pretty cool. Then they came out of the back room and walked past me up the stairs. I noticed that the old man followed her up the steps. He even hesitated so that he was about three steps behind her. It was funny, I chuckled to myself. Hell, let the old man have some fun. There's nothing wrong with that. By the time they reached the top floor where all the rooms for rent were located, she had already made up her mind. The old man and Sharon shook hands, and I sat there wondering what the hell just happened. She called her uncle as soon as we got home. He was worshipping the ground Sharon walked on. She arranged a loan for us, we piled into the Impala, and headed to eastern Oregon two days later. That morning, I was supposed to be at work at the mill, but I called and went on sick leave. I never returned. So quickly, we got into business. Well, if you can call it that. The first autumn and winter were terrible. There were even times of famine. We ate a hell of a lot of fish. Then I got lucky, and a big deer walked out in front of me one frosty February morning, and I killed him with one shot from my dad's old Model 94, 3030 Winchester, that he let me use. The old man told me not to shoot the deer close to the cabin, because sometimes in the winter we might really need it. Hunting close to the cabin made them skittish, but we were just hungry, and I wasn't in the mood to walk miles through deep snow. We ate a lot of fish, but I lost my last lure on a big one. The damn water was so clear I had to use very light lines or they wouldn't bite at all. The pond with the overly greedy brook trout was empty. We ate them all. We couldn't just get into the car and drive home, or anywhere else for that matter. There was almost two meters of snow on the way. 
Clearing gravel roads was out of the question, or the government simply didn't care. For several months, we saw no one, no one at all. The old man left us provisions, mainly canned food and beer. This part was a surprise. He counted every can and bottle and handed me the bill for it. The last money was spent on this, but it didn't matter. We had nowhere to spend the money anyway. The old man left us a large part of the hind quarter of a deer, which was hanging in the kitchen cabinet. It was smoked. I didn't think it was a good idea to store it like that, so I moved it into the refrigerator where there was snow to keep it cold. I left the door ajar. It was much colder outside than in the refrigerator. That night I learned my first lesson. Something broke in and took everything, knocking over cases of beer and generally making a mess in the process. I looked for tracks and found them. It was a huge cougar. Since then, I have never gone outside without a rifle. That's how quickly we ran out of meat. A few days later, I tried hunting and got nowhere. By the time it got very cold outside, fish became difficult to catch. I even tried to track a big cat. I would have skinned it and eaten it if I could have shot it, but I never saw it. By spring, I had lost weight to 77 kilograms from my usual 90. Sharon had lost weight to 36 kilograms. Then finally the weather improved. The day we rented out the first room, we were so happy that we went to our own room downstairs and made love from one end to the other. In fact, several weeks have already passed, but during that first harsh winter, it took us a lot of time and effort. By the end of the week, they were all rented. The campground in front of the house was filling up, people were everywhere, and there was so much work to do that I was up at 4 a.m. and in bed at 11 p.m. The rental houses were booked for the summer, and I started working at the bar. The supplies we had were gone very quickly. Just at this time, a truck arrived from a large city in the north and unloaded beer and provisions. It was a surprise to me, but the old man already had a schedule set up, so they just kept delivering since we didn't even think about it. Green was the word for the two of us, and at first we were not at ease. They made me sign a bill. I looked at it, but I had no idea how we were going to pay for it. By the end of the second week, I had this part figured out, and we had a lot of money, and all in cash. The old man didn't accept checks, and almost everyone who came had been here before. Sharon cooked in the kitchen and was very good at it. One skinny girl who looked like a hippie came, and we hired her as a waitress. She had a cot and just pitched a tent in the woods. She truly was a hippie, right down to the flowers in her hair that she picked from the river. I saw her several times when she swam there. She went into the icy water completely naked and did not worry at all. The first couple of times it was interesting, then I somehow strangely got used to it and didn't pay attention to her. Soon I had to hire another helper to clean the campsite and carry firewood. It was easy. The young Mexican came on foot and happily accepted my offer. That first summer we had a lot of work. For a while I thought it was impossible, but after a while I had a system and everything began to work out. By the end of the second summer, we had paid off Sharon's uncle and put some money in the bank. In two short summers, we went from poor working people to rich businessmen. Well, we were rich by the standards I was used to at least. Winter meant we hunkered down and waited for spring. We spent a lot of time making love. By then, we had a battery-powered television, and if we tuned the little bunny ears correctly, we could receive several snowy stations. I have charged the battery using the alternator, and it always starts right up. The bad thing was that in the spring and summer, I never fished. I worked all day, every day, seven days a week. It was the same with Sharon. She got up at 5 a.m. and went to bed exhausted around 10 p.m. The bar stayed open serving beer. We had another woman who came at 6 in the morning and stayed until 2. The small stream in front of the house was already a fly-fishing-only spot. But in the fall and winter, I didn't pay attention to it because when winter came, fly-fishing became a waste of time. Salmon eggs worked better, or worms when I could find them. Sometimes I dug out huge white ant eggs from rotten tree stumps. Large brook trout and stocked rainbows took the hook eagerly. A few miles downstream, there was a government hatchery from which large broods were released in an attempt to get them to start spawning. I secretly caught more than one of them, smoking the meat for later. This would probably anger the hatchery workers. 
but they still had no way of getting to where we were to find out what we were doing. I soon learned all the deer trails, so that every year I brought down several deer for meat until the snow made hunting difficult. I didn't worry about a hunting license and it was the same here. No cop ever bothered. A few years passed and for some reason, Sharon still didn't decide to have a child, but I was still worried about it because just a little bit of wrong timing could have caused us problems. We talked about it a lot. Then Sharon and I went into town to see the doctor. The news was not very good. Sharon would never become a mother. She cried a little, but I just hugged her and told her that we have each other. Then she accepted everything as it was, and we went back to work. Life was simple, but if anyone had suggested that I would end up here like this, I would have laughed at them. Then there were more buildings, all log buildings, made in the same way as the main building. I spent a long time studying how to do this and just started doing it. It was easy and even moving the logs once they were completely dry wasn't too difficult. I felled a few, peeled the bark off them, and piled them until they were ready. Those that were not long and straight were used for firewood. We changed a lot when we put in the power lines, and now it was big motorhomes pulling boats. There were lakes in the area, several within a radius of several miles. I cut down several slender pines and made parking lots for them. Electric lighting replaced the lamps we used in the beginning, and we even installed heaters, although most people preferred to use wood stoves and fireplaces. He also became a good electrician, having read several books and shocked himself a couple of times. One family got a little carried away with their fire and set fire to one of the houses. We quickly put it out. No one was hurt. I thought they would burn like gasoline, but the huts were pretty windproof, as it was damn cold outside at night, and the big logs just charred. The fire started when I opened the door and turned on the fire extinguisher. So I left just a crack in the door and filled the room with the stuff, then closed the door and damn if it didn't go out. The next day I pulled out all the recently purchased rugs because they looked nice there, took them to the burn pile and set them on fire. We went back to regular wood floors and that was the end of the problem. Then he scraped the logs and painted them a person had to look closely to understand this. I started making tables and chairs from solid pine branches. The tabletops were simply sections of large pine trees that I sawed at an angle so that they were long enough and oval-shaped. Soon we had small cabins, measuring 3.5 by 5 meters, furnished with drawers. They looked quite nice, country-like. One day a client asked if he should buy one of the tables I made, and I sold him one. After that, we always had a few tables with for sale signs and we sold everything I could make and even some chairs. Strangely, the sloppier and rougher they looked, the better they sold. I also quickly discovered that some of the older trees had huge bumps from deer or something, rubbing their antlers on them when they were young. They made very beautiful tabletops and chair seats. I made a dozen or so, put them on the street with crazy price tags, and sold every single one. A few years after we took over, a huge resort opened up a couple of dozen miles or so away from us, and we expected it to destroy us. It worried us. They had golf courses, fancy clubs, lots of things to do. There was no way we could compete with that, I thought, but it seemed to only improve business because many of their clients came to our resort to dine and spend the evening. So many of them stayed with us and then went there to play golf or something else, and this resort helped us a lot. We applied for and received a liquor license. I thought it would be difficult, but it wasn't. I bought a little booklet in town on how to mix drinks, but tending a bar wasn't my thing. Some pretty girl would certainly appear, looking for a summer job, and we would seat her at the bar. Most of them realized that wearing as little clothing as possible would help a lot with tips, and Sharon started getting involved as well. She was in charge of the kitchen, but anyone from the street could look in there. She usually had a lot of skin, and I thought she would get burned, but she never did. Only one bartender gave us any trouble. We sometimes let the maids use the booths. The little brunette we hired suddenly had a lot of visitors. Sharon mentioned that this woman was too flirtatious, as she put it, so I watched her closely for a while. When the third man left after an hour's late visit and walked back towards the parking lot, I already understood everything. Sharon and I took turns mixing drinks until another young woman appeared. 
We didn't mind them playing peekaboo with the jocks who came to visit regularly, but getting laid was a bit much. It turned out surprising that regularly peeking breasts sold a hell of a lot of drinks. Most of the evening, the bar was packed until closing time. I learned to stay away and let the girls do their thing. One evening, a group of bikers showed up and were quite rowdy until Sharon came over, grabbed the so-called leader by the earlobe, and forced him to sit down on a chair. She then told him to stay there until she gave him permission to get up, handed him a beer, and left. He didn't know at all what to do about it. She should have been afraid of him, but she wasn't afraid, not one bit. In addition, he was over 180 centimeters tall, and Sharon was petite, and the guy was completely at a loss what to do. Finally, she told him that he could stand if he promised to behave, after which he acted as if he were her personal protector for the rest of the night. We had a good laugh about it later when she told me about what she had done. After that, the guy came several more times. It was clear that he liked her. He told everyone that Sharon was his little sister and made it very clear that he had an interest. But, of course, he achieved nothing. No one succeeded, but quite a few tried. Over the years, we have received several offers to sell, but all of them have been rejected. The county was trying to offer more development and wanted houses to go up on some of the riverfront properties we owned, but we remained steadfast and refused to sell. Then they tried to change our zone. I had to go to the city to protest and somehow managed to win. Then there were people who wanted to test the waters, drill holes in the ground to see if they could find something. Young guys fresh out of college thought they knew everything about the earth, nature, and how it worked. None of them had the slightest idea. They didn't find anything, either. But my regular collection of firewood and logs came to an end. All the lands next to ours in the west were state forest lands. In the east, they were just desert. A logging company came and cut right up to our property line and basically made a big mess. The trees on our own property were sparse, and I left most of them. After that, we had to bring cargo. This meant additional expenses, but we made good money. We carefully saved everything we could. Our plan was to travel, tour Europe when we retired, and we could well afford it. On the road leading to our resort, houses appeared, and at the other end of our site, there were even more of them. The roads were now cleared in winter, and we could go to the city at any time. The store became a year-round business. We began stocking up on staples, and soon I had to add another building. True, for this we had to buy logs. The 1964 Impala we owned sat in the pine log garage I built and was still almost new. I kept it clean, started it every month or so, and took it for a short ride, then waxed it and put it away. I don't know why I just decided that way. It only had a few thousand miles on it, and I loved it. I also had a pickup truck and drove it. Life consisted of work inventory, keeping track of people coming and going. I never thought I would be in a place like this and doing what I do. It just happened, and it was all because of a hot day and a sign saying, cold beer. This is an impulsive wife. I would tell anyone who asked that we were happy, content with where we were in life. The change came on December 5th. I couldn't forget it. It was Sharon's birthday. She was 38, and I turned 39 in October. We now kept the lodge open year-round, although by December the only people we saw were the few people visiting their holiday homes nearby and a constant stream of snow bunnies. The people who rented rooms from us in the winter almost always had trailers with snowmobiles. We usually just closed the cabins. It was too much work trying to clear the snow, but I kept the front area cleared with the help of my big Honda ATV, which I installed a bucket and blade on. Celebrating her birthday... Sharon and I had had our third glass of wine and were cuddling by the fire when the bell rang in the main cottage. What the hell? At this time of year, we turn off the outside lights at 10 p.m., so we weren't expecting anyone. I looked at the clock. It was almost 11. I'll open it, Sharon said, jumping up and reaching for her pullover dress. I was unhappy that we were interrupted. She was naked and beautiful and I absolutely loved playing with her big breasts. They're a little more saggy now than when we were crazy kids, but I still loved the way they felt. Besides, it was her birthday, and I had plans for the entire evening. She returned 15 minutes later. 
Two young guys and a woman. I put them upstairs in number six. Two? And a woman? Is there only one bed? Yeah, but they said that's all they needed, she giggled. All the rooms upstairs were just bedrooms with a half bath. We usually rented them out to singles or couples because the showers were shared and everyone had to go down the back stairs and down the short hallway next to our rooms. I've always wanted to fix this, but I'd have to take down the entire back wall and move it around to make room, and I wasn't in the mood to do that. Two men and one woman in one room, right? I laughed. There was nothing special about it. We had our share of party types, and we were both pretty cool about it all. This was a resort, after all, and there was no end to the pranks. Besides, Sharon did everything she could to look sexy, and the girls we hired to work behind the bar figured it out quickly. I saw more than my fair share of nearly bare breasts while they worked, and that helped keep people in line at the bar. Yes, young guys, the woman is really beautiful. Maybe family or something like that? I don't think so. She chuckled and then pressed herself against me again. I forgot about them. The fire was warm, and so did Sharon. Later, I woke up to someone knocking on the door. I stood up and, pulling on my roby, opened at it. Sorry to bother you, but we can't turn on the heater. There stood a tall young man dressed in jeans and a T-shirt. Fine, I'll be right there. Taking my small set of tools, I went up to him. He answered my knock, and I went in to check the wall heater, wondering why they didn't just start a fire in the fireplace. Then a quick glance explained to me the reason. They tried, but they couldn't put a whole log on the paper and light it. I almost stopped. A young woman was reclining on the bed. Another man was lying on top of the blanket. He was wearing only his underpants, and she was sitting bare-chested, the blanket tucked around her waist. Her upper body was impressive. This is Karen, this is Sam, and I'm John, the man said acting as if the woman sitting there topless was completely normal. I nodded and pulled my robe tighter, suddenly realizing that this was all I had on. I checked the switch. Nothing. But the wiring was live. Damn it. It must be the block itself. But I couldn't seem to get it fixed today. Can we just move you to another room? I asked. Fine. He walked over and took the bag. I noticed that there was only one. Entering the fifth room, I turned on the heater, and it began to glow after a few seconds. That's it? This one is fine. I turned around just in time to see Karen enter. She was completely naked. She was about 158 centimeter tall and well-built. She showed absolutely no signs of modesty. She simply walked over and sat down on the bed, leaning back against the pillows. Over the years, there have been quite a few incidents of nudity. After all, our place was a resort and a bit remote at that. One rather large woman was running through the corridors one evening with her breasts bare. We managed to get her to put on a blouse after we cut her off from her drinks, but soon she was playing pool with a few young guys, and it quickly became obvious that she wasn't wearing any panties. Then she and her husband retired to one of the booths, and at about the same time, the young guys left. That evening, Sharon and I lay in bed together and giggled at the fun. After a few years, topless by the river became more the norm than not. The first couple of times I saw women with bare breasts, I was surprised. But now we just didn't pay attention to it. Several times I looked in there to see some girl wandering around without a single thread. They usually stayed close to the river behind the bushes. There was a nice pool with a grassy bank. Many vacationers use this place for swimming. Sharon and I discussed it, but then we just shrugged it off and let them do whatever they wanted. So it wasn't that Karen was completely naked, it was the way she acted. It didn't help that I was only wearing a robe. Hell, it was almost three in the morning. I quickly left, feeling very excited. The girl was hot. Sharon, of course, noticed immediately when I returned to our bedroom. She giggled and reached out to me. I told her what happened, but she just thought it was funny. The next day, the three of them left, and as soon as I saw Karen, I felt myself getting horny again. How she could look almost obscene, even fully clothed boggles the mind. She didn't do or say a single thing that was different from what a client would normally do. 
I managed to tell myself that it was only in my head and not in reality, but the vision remained. As they walked away, Karen turned her head and smiled brightly at me, and the vision of her naked and completely liberated returned to my mind. She simply walked from one room to another, then sat down on the bed, casually spreading her legs. There were three men in the room. The two men pretended not to notice anything. For several days after that, all I had to do was think about that brief moment, and I was up and ready to go. Sharon was always ready, but after a week, she noticed a sudden increase in my masculinity. Okay, so what has gotten you so excited lately? She asked. She sat next to me and stroked me with both hands. This got me horny again for the third time in one day. Damn, I was almost like a kid again. Is this the woman who was recently naked? No. Well, yes, partly that is, I think, and partly it's just the fact that you're sitting here and looking like this. I reached out and caressed one of her breasts, and she sighed. Did you want to take possession of her? I blinked. No, nothing like that. Just the way she was naked and casual, like it was all completely normal. I guess it was for her. Maybe. So, you like carefree nudity, huh? I've never seen you like this. Except sometimes when I... She giggled and I knew what she meant. Watching her behind the bar doing her thing never turned me on. Sorry, I don't know what came over me. Don't apologize, I like it. She chuckled, then lay down next to me, pressed herself against my neck, and placed one hand on my chest. The rest of the off-season went well, summer came, and chaos set in again. By July, it was scorching hot, and I was very busy installing the air conditioners we bought for all the rooms. The wiring was interesting, now there were state regulations, so I kept having to call the county to have an inspector come and sign little forms. It was a pure pain in the ass, Bad enough that I could no longer run extension cords like in the old days, but every time they showed up, they would reach out for the circuit board. I was outside on the top deck I had built, almost standing on my head, attaching the cable under the railing so it wouldn't be visible, when I looked up and saw a woman walking down the road. At first, I didn't attach any importance to it. People often walked along the road. It was pretty quiet during the day. Everyone was mostly by the river as it was almost 38 outside. Sharon was downstairs in the kitchen, getting everything ready for the evening meal. We knew a couple dozen or so people would show up. They always did. At that moment, a beer truck pulled up. It momentarily blocked my view of the woman. I saw her stop as the dust rose and momentarily ran her hand over her face. Then she started walking again. I realized that she was moving strangely. I crawled out from under the railing, looked out again, and saw her trip and almost fall. I dropped my tools and walked down the stairs, figuring she was probably suffering from heat stroke. I caught her and stopped her from falling just as I reached her. Her face was white and dry, her eyelids fluttered, and there was a blank expression on her face. I picked her up and carried her back to the house. I placed it on a chair near the vent and went behind the bar to get some water and towels. By the time I returned, she had gone completely limp. Sharon, I need help. I exclaimed, wet the towel, and began to dry the woman's face and neck. There was no reaction when the cool towel touched her skin. What's the matter, honey? Sharon came out, looked at me, and stopped. About! She understood, walked over, and turned the fan on high. Heat stroke. I found her on the road. I was still drying her. Her t-shirt was wet. Sharon handed me a bottle of water, and I raised it to my lips and knocked it back for her to take a sip. It's the same woman, Sharon said. Which? I looked at her again, and then it dawned on me. It was Karen, the one who stayed for one night, the one I had almost forgotten about in my fantasies. Her hair was long and styled, there was no sign of makeup, and because she looked gaunt, I didn't recognize her. Sharon lifted her t-shirt up to her chest and began applying cold towels to her stomach while I washed her neck and head. At that moment, she stirred and looked at me. What's happened? she asked. You're a little overheated, miss, I told her. Here, take another sip of water. I put the bottle in her hand. She drank a little and sighed. Wow, my head is spinning. Just sit and rest, I told her, placing the wet towel back on her neck. 
Her face began to take on color, and a few beads of sweat appeared on her forehead. Half an hour later, she seemed to come to her senses and drank almost all the water. Thank you for helping me, she finally said. No problem. What were you doing walking in such heat? We were camping at the lake. John and I had an argument and I left. I'm just tired of him. I tried to return to the city on foot. The city was 75 miles away. I can take you there if you want, but there's no way you can walk that far in this heat, I told her. Anyway, I don't have anyone there. She looked so sad when she said that. So where do you want to go? I asked. I don't know. I'll find something. I don't want to be a hindrance. Then she started crying. Man, crying women. What does a man do with a crying woman? Sharon sat next to her and consoled her. I made up an excuse and slipped away to my work, deciding that Sharon would handle it. When I arrived later that day to help with the preparations, I found them both in the kitchen. Karen was busy preparing a huge bowl of salad. Sharon was pulling one of her wonderful ribs out of the oven. People had already begun to appear at the entrance. Maria, our waitress, showed up on time. Sharon just looked at me and grinned, and I didn't say a word. If there was a kitten or baby squirrel within 50 miles, Sharon would take care of it. I accepted the role, so I just went to work behind the bar. We went through four bartenders this season, and they all either had sticky fingers or had their share of drinks, so I was doing double duty as a bartender myself. I was just washing my hands when they both came out. Go get some rest, honey. We got everything settled, Sharon said. Karen stood at the bar and began mixing drinks. I watched her for a second or two, but it quickly became clear that she knew exactly what she was doing. She was also wearing one of Sharon's halter tops, which was at least two sizes too big for her. As she reached down to grab a beer for someone from the floor refrigerator, her entire breasts showed for a second. Sharon grinned at me. I grinned back, just shrugged and went to our room to take a nap. I woke up very late when Sharon arrived. I must have been tired because I slept like a rock. It was a really good evening. We made almost 2,000, she said, stripping off her clothes and heading to the shower. Wow, I said. At that time, it was very close to our record. Yes, Karen is very good and fast, and it's clear that she already worked in a bar. She will help us a lot. It was obvious that we had a new employee. I put her in room six, she said over her shoulder. Fine. Have you found out what's wrong with her? Yes, her boyfriend John likes to watch her with other men. It became too much for her, and they had a big fight. Oh, it's a perversion, isn't it? I've heard about this. It's strange. Yeah, I think so too, but anyway, Karen's bar was packed until we closed. She giggled as she walked over to the bed. How did she do it? I asked. I think they liked looking at her, she laughed. I can imagine. Not having to work at the bar in the evening after working all day was a relief, and we all got into a rhythm. Karen helped Sharon with the evening meal, which really wasn't too much work since we only made a couple of dishes each night and varied them. People ate what we served, it worked very well, and meant we had very little waste. Every evening, Karen came to the bar, which now seemed crowded most of the time. I stopped by to see how things were going. Karen was interesting to see. Her hands seemed to be flying. She was turning over bottles. She definitely used to work in a bar. She also looked just mischievous. She was wearing Sharon's spare clothes, which she had altered to fit her better. It didn't really help. Half the room away, I could see her breasts coming into view every time she bent over to do something. She had the exact same demeanor, as if being naked was normal. Customers lined up at the bar and seemed to enjoy watching her. Damn, I loved watching her too. Plus, she still had the same influence on me. I found it was easier to just stay away from her as much as possible, so I spent most of my time doing other things. The best thing to do was leave it at that. We were making money and the last thing I wanted was a fight with my wife. The few times we had disagreements, she still won. Autumn came, and I started up the big wood splitter I had built. This thing, I swear, could cut a railroad tie in half. I tried a few commercial machines, but they were all almost like toys, so I just built my own from scratch. The 17-horsepower gas engine was from an old lawnmower, paired with a 2400 PSI hydraulic cylinder with 30 inches of stroke, so it made quick work of even the toughest knots and hardwoods. 
I just had to be careful and keep my fingers away. Hello, Danny. I heard Karen's voice behind me. I looked back and she was wearing short shorts and a halter top that didn't hide her figure. She looked amazing, but back then, she always looked amazing. Good morning. It will be hot today, which is rare for October here. I was just keeping the conversation going. I wiped my forehead with the back of my hand. Yes, I feel it. About to go sunbathe by the pond, Sharon said everything was fine and she would be there in half an hour or so. Oh, good. I'll just finish this pile and maybe go fishing. I looked back at the RV park. There was only one car left and I was sure they would leave later, so we were entering this free period for us. I was just finishing stacking wood when Sharon came out. I looked at her and stopped. Wow, I said. Do you like it? She grinned. She was wearing a black bikini that I had seen before, but quite a few years had passed. She had a large towel over her shoulders. There was a slight bulge on her stomach that wasn't there when she was 18, but otherwise she looked about the same. Even after seeing her naked literally thousands of times, she looked stunning in that tiny costume. Will you follow the sun? I said. Yes, Karen is already there. Today, we'll just hang out. Maybe I should join you instead of going fishing. I grinned. Maybe it's worth it. Karen doesn't even have a swimsuit. There's no one around, so I can sunbathe naked too. Sharon gave me another mischievous grin and continued down the path. I stood there and blinked. Then he went and took his Honda ATV, rolled the big splitter block into the sump, and covered it with a tarp. For this year, he was done with it. Then I went inside. Maria was polishing the bar in the living room, not a soul around. I knew her husband, Carlos, cleaned the RV park and campgrounds we rented out. Maria and Carlos showed up at the beginning of the season looking for work, exactly on schedule. Someone almost always showed up when things got busy, and we now usually had half a dozen helpers for the season. This was their fourth year. We were already used to them coming to work for the whole season. We paid both of them very well. We could afford it and that made them good workers. How about you open my beer? I asked her. I rarely drank anything, but I was hot and sweaty. She leaned over and grabbed a beer from the cooler we kept under the bar. It was actually an ice maker and small pieces of ice kept the beer cold so it could be served as ice cream. Because of this, we sold a hell of a lot of beer. I glanced at Maria as she leaned over and it struck me that there was a hell of a lot of Maria in view. I could see her whole chest then she stood up and handed me the bottle. No wonder, I knew full well that the girls teased. But since Karen arrived, I tried to stay away from the living room. It was easier for me. We didn't need problems, and there was something about her that just turned me on. I took it out on Sharon, and she didn't seem to mind at all. Besides, as winter set in, I was sure that Karen would leave, and Sharon and I would be left alone again, with just the occasional visitor and a few people on snowmobiles. Sharon, of course, understood. There was a reason for my sudden increase in masculinity. The vision of Karen just walking into the room naked, completely carefree, kept appearing in my mind. My way of dealing with it was to just work. I sat and thought, compared to a normal year, the bar was a lot of work. Maria was here, as cute as a bug's ear, and she knew I was spying on her. A smile crossed her face as she uncorked the bottle of beer. Reaching into my pocket, I took out a cigarette. It's now damn illegal due to a new county law, one of the first in the state. But who cared? The cops never showed up here anyway, and I doubted they would care either. Maria grinned and handed me the ashtray that we hid behind the bar counter. So, do you like working here? I asked her. Yes, I really like it. Good tip, Carlos and I want to come back next season if possible. Of course, everything will be fine. Good tip, right? Yes. Karen and your wife work well, too. We paid Maria $10 an hour, but I knew she usually doubled her salary with tips. She worked the 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. shift when work was slower and busier at night. I finished my drink and started to get up to leave. Carlos said that he would like to stay here for the winter. We know there is no work here, but could we pay you rent? I thought about it and nodded. In fact, I could use some help in the off-season. It could work. Maybe rent in exchange for help with the renovations I was putting off until the off-season. 
I decided to find Carlos and talk to him about it. He wasn't at the campsite. I went out to a large barn, but he wasn't there either. Deciding to wait until late evening, I headed down to the river, grabbing my fishing rod along the way. I knew Sharon and Karen would be at the point where the river widened into a deeper pool. There was a grassy bank, and it faced the afternoon sun. I stopped further along the river and cast my fishing rod, catching a fat rainbow on the first cast. I caught it on a barbless hook and released it. A few more casts yielded nothing, so I continued upriver to the pool. As I stepped out into the opening, I immediately stopped. Karen lay there on her back, completely naked. Sharon was lying on the blanket, face down, without a top. Carlos sat next to them, wearing only shorts. Nothing unusual. Carlos often worked without a shirt. He was very well built and muscular. This made me a little angry. Carlos had to work, and although Sharon was wearing a swimsuit that could be considered a little skimpy, her presence in front of him without a top didn't bother me at all. I also didn't like that he was there with Karen, who was wearing nothing at all. I felt a flash of jealousy and could not hide it. Carlos looked at me as I approached him. He caught the expression on my face and blushed. I better get back to work, sir. Sorry. I just took a break. He jumped up, walked over, climbed onto the ATV, and drove away. Hi, darling, Sharon said, rolling onto her back. The white part of her breasts was pink. I knew that she had not been lying face down all this time. What's happening? I asked. Nothing, we're just sunbathing. I tried my best not to look at Karen. She was lying on her back and just looking at me. What the hell was Carlos doing here? He just came in, stopped and chatted with us for a bit. Nothing special. I let it fade and then moved further down the creek, catching a few more fat trout. Later I returned to the cabin and Sharon and Karen were in the kitchen preparing dinner. We all sat down at the table to eat dinner. Carlos and Maria came in and joined the three of us. There was a lot of food, so Sharon jumped up and put two more plates down. I talked to Carlos about staying over the winter. He liked the idea and agreed. Maria was happy about this. She had never liked the idea of them having to return to their own country. Plus, they both had green cards, so I didn't have to worry about anything like that. All the news lately had been about illegal immigrants in the country. With all that settled, over the next few days, we did everything we needed to do to prepare for winter. Since some business takes place all year round, more help would make my life easier. On December 10th, five days after Sharon's birthday, the phone rang. Her mother was very ill, and I could see that Sharon was very shaken up by this. I told her to get the pickup and drive to Portland and get on a plane to Los Angeles to be near her mom. Her mom moved there to be closer to her sister after Sharon and I got married years ago. I stayed behind to keep an eye on the situation, telling her that if things got serious, I would fly to her. Her mom had a stroke, and initial plans for her to be there for a week or so turned into two, then three, then a month. Business was slow and steady, but not crazy. I was working with Karen and Maria at the bar, and Carlos was constantly going somewhere, fixing something. One evening, after we had closed, I was sitting in my room when there was a knock on the door. I expected it to be Carlos, who needed something, and he was surprised when he saw Mary standing there. Can I come in, Danny? She asked. Without thinking, I stepped aside to let her in. She turned to me as I closed the door and smiled. Carlos sent me to you. He knows that you are alone now, and you must have some needs. She smiled and unbuttoned her blouse, shaking it off her shoulders. I stood and was surprised. This was the last thing I expected. I didn't answer her. She unfastened the clasp on the side of the skirt she was wearing and stepped out of it too. There was nothing underneath. I should have protested. I should have said no. If things had been even close to normal when Sharon was around, I think I would have done exactly that. But more than a month has passed. I lost control and reached out to her. Somehow, we ended up on my bed. She was horny. I've wanted this for so long, she exclaimed when we got down to business. The first time went by very quickly. The second time lasted much longer. Later, as we lay with her unfamiliar body pressed closely against mine, 
I felt remorse. It was very nice, Danny. We can do more of this if you want. I can take care of you until Sharon gets back. Oh God, what have I done here? I said. It's okay. Carlos doesn't mind. In fact, he likes it. At home, when we visit his brothers and friends, we... I just looked at her. I had heard of similar things, but it was strange to my own lifestyle. It was like Sharon had mentioned, Karen in passing. We can't, we just can't do this anymore. Sharon will never understand. I got up and went to the bathroom. Maria was already fully dressed when I returned with a towel wrapped around me. Forgive me, Danny. I didn't mean to. I just thought you needed... What will I tell Sharon? Maybe then it would be better if we just didn't tell. Maria looked at me. I didn't understand her facial expression or her reaction. She acted as if it was completely normal for her to come to my room to have sex, even though we were both married to others. Perhaps it was like that for her. But for me, that wasn't the case. And now I have a problem. I violated the only thing that my wife and I had in common, complete trust in each other. Sharon and I spoke frequently on the phone. Her mother was showing signs of improvement, and they made arrangements for a full-time care facility. I didn't mention the incident with Maria. I just didn't know how to do it and didn't want to tell her about it over the phone. After that, I saw Carlos several times. He acted as if nothing had happened, which surprised me. I thought about firing them both to make sure they wouldn't be around when Sharon got home, but that would leave me alone in charge of the cottage, with no one but Karen. At this point, I no longer trusted myself alone with anyone. I was well aware that I was thinking about her. Then a very strong snowstorm began. I knew from the weather forecasts that it was coming. We've had a few bad snowstorms over the years, but based on reports, this one was going to be really bad. Carlos and I worked like horses to keep things as safe as possible. We packed extra firewood close to the blocks we were using to be sure. Carlos suggested that the five of us could just spend the night in the main cottage, but I declined. I just didn't trust myself, not after what happened with Maria. Instead, Carlos and Maria were going to wait it out in the largest cabin that was closest to the main cottage, Karen in hers upstairs, and I in mine downstairs. The cabin Carlos and Maria used was only 200 meters away, but with the heavy snow and cold, it could have been many miles. Often up to a meter of snow fell, and during the most severe storms, even more. We settled in and were as ready as we could be for the snow to arrive. By the morning of the next day, more than half a meter of snow had fallen. I couldn't even see the trees along the road. Then the wind came. It was strong. We lost power and it was impossible to fix. Nothing could get through. I knew it would be several days before it was restored. Going down to the generator house, I started the engine and it immediately started working. This gave us light and enough power to run all the 110 volt outlets, but not enough to run the big heaters. By the end of the week, I was carrying firewood to Karen's room and my own, as well as to the kitchen. I kept the fire burning in the kitchen to warm the room. Karen was still using the upstairs room. We were hesitant to let it cool down completely, as it could take quite a while to get it back to a comfortable state. Finally, we began to use only the main part of the house, her room, mine, and the kitchen. We didn't see any sign of Carlos or Maria. There was about two meters of snow on the ground, and there was more of it every day. The temperature dropped below zero and stayed there. I was bringing another load of pine firewood when Karen told me that she had lost water in her room. I went and checked. One line was frozen. I was able to shut off the internal valve and close it, which stopped all the water flowing upward. By opening the emergency check valves, I drained the water from these lines to prevent further damage. The secondary lines to my section were buried just over a meter deep, so I had water. Within an hour, I discovered that we had lost the main part of the house, so I turned off that part as well. I made a mental note to fix it so it never happened again. We've never been cold before, but then it's never been this cold for a long time. During the day, the outside thermometer showed minus 12 degrees, but at night I did not see it. I went out and checked the house with the generator. It was still working. The main well pump was working. 
the exhaust pipe from the engine was routed a couple of meters inside and then out, so the temperature in the generator house was well above zero. The 500-gallon diesel tank was more than half full, and I knew we had at least another week before we were in serious trouble. To add insult to injury, I discovered that the phone lines were not working. Sharon had a cell phone. I didn't. Now, we were completely cut off from the outside world. What are we going to do, Danny? Karen asked when I returned to the house, shaking my hands, which ached from the cold. All that's left is my section. She can handle it. We need to move you there, I told her. She nodded and went and gathered a few things. There was nothing more to do. For the next two days, Karen lived with me. She took the bedroom and I took the sofa in the living section where I could start a fire. There were no problems with provisions. We had enough supplies in the kitchen to last us until spring and beyond. I was glad that the old man who built the house had the wisdom to separate the water lines, even if some froze, others would remain open. It was clear that the problem we were facing was created by me when I added to the house. I cleverly ran the water lines along the base of the walls so they wouldn't be visible. It was my mistake. Eleven days in a row, daytime temperatures fell below 10 degrees, and nighttime temperatures fell well below zero. The snow did not stop. It lay over the windows. When I woke up, I saw Karen loading wood into the stove. It seems the street is clearing up. She looked at me with a smile. I looked at her and turned away. She was wearing a white T-shirt and flannel short pajama pants that didn't hide her figure much. Rolling out of bed, I grabbed my Levi shirt and pulled it on. Looking out the window, I saw a thermometer hanging on a pole. It was seven degrees, practically hot compared to what we had been through. I better go see Carlos and Maria while I have the chance, I said. Karen nodded. I'm going to take a shower while you're gone, okay? I nodded and walked over and turned the valve that was running water through a small wood-burning heating tank. The main generator handled the lights with all the simple 110-volt power supplies, but the water heater was 220 volts, and that was too much for our unit. Karen started a small fire. She knew what to do, so I got out my heavy winter gear, found my snowshoes, and hit the road. It was hard to walk, the snow was very fluffy, soft, and even in snowshoes, every step was difficult. It took me a full half hour to get to the top house. I found it almost buried under snow, waves of heat emanating from the large stainless steel chimney. I had a snow shovel right by the entrance and I cleared it in a few minutes. All the doors, for obvious reasons, opened inward. Carlos opened it and looked out, hearing that I was outside. Nice storm, huh? Are you guys okay? He stepped aside to let me inside. Yeah, okay, I just came by to check on you two. Maria was sitting on the sofa by the fireplace. It was about 27 degrees inside. She smiled and jumped up, went to the kitchen, and brought us both cups of coffee. I sat down and explained to Carlos about the plumbing and what I wanted to do to fix it so it wouldn't happen again. Maria smiled at me several times but said nothing and I felt myself blush at the memory of her naked body in my arms. After finishing my coffee, I got up to go back to the cottage. As soon as I opened the door, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. It was snowing heavily, and the temperature dropped again. Be careful, Carlos said, closing the door. In fact, it was easier to return. I made a path by walking along it. I walked the 200 meters to the cottage, but by the time I got there, I was exhausted realizing that I was soaked with sweet. I took off my heavy winter clothes, took out a dry t-shirt and pulled it on. You could hear water running in the bathroom. I sat down in a chair to rest. Just at that moment, Karen came out. She wrapped one of the large bath towels around herself. She walked up to the stove, turned her back to it, and began to dry herself with a towel. And again, she was completely naked in front of me with the same completely indifferent attitude towards it. I just sat and watched her fiddling with her hair and her soft breasts swaying slightly. I think everything is okay there, she finally said, lowering the towel to look at me. She must have seen the look on my face because her eyes widened. Oh. She dropped the towel on the floor and walked over to me, sliding into my lap. I had no way to resist. 
just in time, she muttered. After that, everything was like a fog. That first day we only stopped to throw some on the fire and then went straight back to bed. Sharon was forgotten. My life was forgotten. Everything was lost in a whirlwind of crazy sex and fantasies. All that previous life seemed distant in another time. As the weather began to warm up toward the end of the week, Carlos and I began digging, replacing broken water lines, and making repairs. We had to shovel a lot of snow off the road. The damage wasn't as bad as I expected, and soon everything was working again. Nothing was said about Maria. We worked together as if everything was normal. Every night I snuggled up next to Karen. I knew some of it was wrong, but I just couldn't help it. Then our phones started ringing again. Sharon called and said they had worked things out with her mother and moved her to a long-term care facility. She'll be home by the weekend. Karen's face dropped when I explained. I wasn't sure what she was thinking. But she returned to her room. The next day she told me she was leaving. I really didn't want her to leave, but at the same time I knew that it would be better this way. Sharon arrived looking as beautiful as ever. I told her about how we survived the big storm, explaining that we had to change some things because the water was gone almost everywhere. So where did you all live? she asked. Carlos and Maria stayed in the big hut, and Karen and I, we stayed here. Oh, yes, it was probably for the best. Sharon looked at me. Apparently, I'm not hiding everything very well. She understood. She understood right then. Oh, Danny, you didn't do it? Where is she? She left. She left yesterday. Damn you, I trusted you. There was anger and resentment in her expression. I walked over and sat down. Honey, forgive me. It just happened. How long did you sleep with her? You bastard. There were probably others. It was just, I don't know. My face turned red. Who else? Do not lie to me. Maria. She came to see me. I do not know why. Sharon stared at me. I couldn't meet her eyes. In our bed? In my bed? She said this with an expression that I had never seen before. There were more tears, more screams. She entered the house, gathered her things, ran out and went upstairs to one of the rented apartments, slammed the door, and locked it. The next day after lunch, she left and returned to her mother. Neither talking nor pleading had any effect. Only a week had passed when a station wagon arrived to pick up Carlos and Maria. I watched them load the car, didn't come out to say goodbye, and they didn't bother to come in. Over and over again, I tried to call Sharon, but she did not answer my calls and did not want to discuss anything. Finally, there was no point, I stopped calling. I sat and cried like a child when the papers arrived. She completely refused to talk to me. Instead, I had to talk to her lawyer. Sharon didn't want any part of the cabin or the resort. She got the savings, the capital we had carefully saved in retirement accounts. I didn't even protest. It was quite a lot. Equity funds performed very well. She left me enough money to work. Karen called just once. I told her that Sharon left me and she apologized. Then she said she loved Sharon, but she loved me even more. When I didn't respond, she said goodbye. That was the end of it. She never talked about coming back and I never asked. A very long spring and summer passed. I managed to hire help, but nothing was the same. Forcing myself to work helped somehow, but nights alone in bed were very difficult. Then came one of those offers that we received all the time, but we ignored them. I called the broker and made an appointment. It was already the end of the season. The year had been unsuccessful. There seemed to be no point. The offer was quite profitable. I told the broker to go ahead and do the paperwork. But still hesitant, I explained that I would look at it all, and if I decided to accept the offer, he would get the deal. A few days later, I woke up late and made breakfast. There were no guests in the cottage, but I still went downstairs to open it. About an hour or so later, a car pulled up to the house. It was one of those big Dodge cars that the cops seemed to drive on TV. A young couple came out. It warmed up quickly, and it was a nice early autumn day. They entered and looked around. They seemed to be exploring everything around them. The woman was wearing shorts and a halter top. 
Her midriff was exposed. I just stood at the bar and waited. Wow, this place is really very beautiful, said the young woman. I looked at her. She was no more than twenty years old. Is there any cold beer? asked the young man. I uncorked two bottles and placed them on the bar counter. They sat down grinning at each other as they each took a sip. We didn't even know this place existed here, said the young man. He's probably about sixty years old. I'm selling it now. It's time for me to retire. Is it true? asked the young woman. I saw a sparkle of interest in her eyes. A memory flashed through my mind of how many years ago Sharon and I walked through this same door, around the same time of year. Yes, to several rich people. Maybe they are going to make this place private. I don't like it. But what can I do? We'd like to have a place like that, wouldn't we, Johnny? We got money from my grandfather's inheritance. Something like this would be a great investment. The guy had a doubtful look on his face. I chuckled to myself. Tell me, how does it hold together? He asked, looking fascinated at the worn railings. I'm just cutting down a tree, cutting out a peg. Then I lubricate it with resin and hammer it in. I coat the resin with clay and cover it with stain. I have a five-gallon bucket. It's very simple. Wow, I can do this, he said. Yeah, if I can do it, anyone can. I looked at the young girl. She was leaning with one elbow on the bar railing. A large area of her left breast was visible. She just smiled when she caught my eye. Let's go, honey. Let me show you around, I told her. Less than a couple of months later, I shook hands with a young couple and wished them luck. The old 1964 Impala started right up, like always. I looked at the odometer and it showed just over 9,000 miles. Three days later, I drove up to Sharon's house in California. It was December 5th, her birthday. Her eyes widened in surprise when she saw me. Danny? What? I wanted to see you, find out how you were doing. Everything is fine with me. My mother lives here now. I take care of her. This is good. I felt completely awkward. So many things were running through my head. Words were spinning in my head for many kilometers of driving. Well, come on in. Who runs the resort? She stepped aside to let me inside. I sold it. She looked at this in surprise. I thought you'd never do this? Me too, but managing it alone just didn't make sense. How much did you get? She asked. A little less than two million, they contributed almost half, and I took a receipt from them for 30 years. Wow, it turned out to be a good investment, didn't it? Yes. Another offer was higher, from some large company. You know how I feel about this. But these two guys came and... Remember that day when we... Yes, of course, I remember. She smiled. I saw that she was thinking about it. You looked obscene that day. It's a wonder the old man didn't have a heart attack. Sharon laughed, and for a moment we were just each other again, sharing memories. I sat down, she asked if I wanted some tea, and went to the kitchen to prepare it. I watched her leave the room. At almost 46 years old, she still looked about the same. We sat and sipped tea, reminiscing about the last year and a half. Eventually, the conversation turned to Maria and then to Karen, and I apologized, explaining that I would do anything to get it back. Sharon didn't show anger like before. They say time heals all wounds. This gave me some hope. I want to be with you again, I said. She just looked at me. That's all I can think about. I know I did you wrong. Danny, you were the first and only man I was with while we were together. You know that? Yes, I know. I fell silent while she hesitated, thinking, You were enough for me. More than enough, in fact. I felt the same way. Some of the moments that happened, we wanted this ourselves, didn't we? I think the same. Did you know that Carlos was hitting on me? I didn't know, but I think he could. I hit him in the face. You should have told me. There was nothing to tell. Sometimes in the evening, when we were working, men made proposals and asked questions. I assumed that this probably happened. We asked for it ourselves, I think, with all our mischief. I've dated several men since we broke up, she blurted out. About. Now I'm dating a man. His name is Carl. He wants to marry me. I felt my heart drop. I, we, I let him make love to me. This is fine. 
I really didn't expect... Shut up, I'm trying to tell you something. She snapped. I waited, nodding. It was different. It wasn't the same. All I could think about was that I was doing something wrong. He... Carl... He wanted me, and I thought I wanted him, and realized too late that I didn't want that. I nodded. But I let him anyway. I wanted him, but then I didn't want him. Sharon, I... It doesn't matter. There were others... Before him... Right after we broke up, I wanted to find someone. Move on. Sharon, it really doesn't matter. Shut up. I have not finished yet. There were quite a few others. Five. Six, I think. I can't even remember them. Like I did this to... Get revenge? It made me miserable. Like I was cheating, but there was no one to cheat on. She looked at me to see my reaction. I just sat there and waited. Then I met Carl. He is handsome and kind, I thought, maybe. He's a lot of fun, too. I didn't jump into bed with him. Then finally, he told me he loved me. After Carl and I had... Sex. I wanted to call you right then, and I would have, but Carl was here. He stayed the night that first time. He is the only one I allowed to stay with me all night. The next morning, he... I let him do it again. The feeling was the same, as if I was doing something wrong. But from then on, every time we met, we ended up in bed. I do not know why, but even then, I felt like I was doing something wrong. Sharon paused, lost in thought. Her face turned red, and she found it difficult to talk about it. Carl asked me to marry him. I told him I would go out. I thought I could overcome this bad feeling. This statement sounded like a blow to the stomach. At first you called so often I wanted to answer, but I just couldn't. I was too angry, too stubborn. But then you stopped calling. I sat and waited many nights, wanting to hear your voice, even if only on the answering machine. But then you stopped, and I realized that you had given up. I never gave up, but I wanted to give you some space. So tell me, what was it like for you? Sex, I mean, with someone else? I felt guilt. Me too. But did you do it anyway? She looked at me. Her eyes were wet. Yes. Me too. She repeated, a tear running down her cheek. I reached out to her. It seemed like the most natural thing in the world. She allowed me to hug her but made no move to respond. Finally, I let her go. And what? Why did you come all this way? To see you. I want you to be with me. It has always been you since we were still children. Now I have tears in my eyes. We can't go back, you know, she finally said. I know, but we can move forward. You think so? Or will this always be the case? Will it always bother you that other men... Maybe. Just like you will. We both know there are no secrets. Maybe. Tell me. Have you been with anyone else? Since I left? No. She watched me carefully. She knew that I was telling the truth. Okay, she finally said, reaching out to take my hand. We sat like that for a long time, just holding hands. Then her phone rang and she stood up to answer it. I heard half of the conversation. Um, um... I cannot today. Because Danny is here, we're talking about trying again. There was a long pause while she listened. I'm sorry, Carl. Is it true? I have to do this. I have to find out if we can still... She listened again for a moment. No, no, he's just arrived. Please don't be like that, Carl. She hung up and turned to look at me. Carl told me he wouldn't stand for it, and if I went back to you, he wouldn't want to see me again, even if I changed my mind. I guess I understand that. I haven't been able to give up for almost 30 years. I thought I could, but I can't. She came over and sat down again, leaning her head against my shoulder. I thought I loved Carl, too, but with him, it seems... wrong? The phone rang again. She made no move to answer. After a dozen calls, the phone went silent. I'm confused. Let's not rush. I want to fall in love with you again. I want to be able to trust you, she finally said. I'm already completely in love with you. You can trust me. I will never touch another woman again for the rest of my life, even if we don't work out, I told her. We sat on the sofa. 
I hugged her shoulders. She was there with me, where she belonged. A lot of time had passed, and her body felt stiff and tense. I felt when she began to relax. Then she turned her head and raised her lips for a kiss. Familiar. Soft. The touch of our lips was the same as always. Sharon was in my arms. That was all I needed. A few hours later, I got up to leave. Stay here, please. Fine. With pleasure. You'll sleep there in the spare bedroom, okay? Fine. If you want it. That's what I want. Good night. She went to her room and closed the door. I went to another room and settled down there. I heard the shower running. It ran for what seemed like an hour. Finally, I dozed off. A sound woke me up. I looked at the clock. It was already three o'clock in the morning. It took me a moment to realize that Sharon was standing at the door. Danny? She asked. Yes, dear? Do you really want me? More than anything else, I told her. Can I go to bed with you? You should never ask me that, I told her, throwing back the blanket. She dove in, pulled the blanket up, and snuggled up to me. She was completely naked, familiar, sweet. These are the appropriate words. Sharon lay there, enjoying the fact that our bodies were still touching. We were both drenched in sweat. Am I still beautiful? She asked. For me, you are the most beautiful in the world. I love only you, Danny. Only you, she said. I leaned over and kissed her. Life was okay again. Europe was beautiful. The year passed in getting to know the sights of the world. Sharon's mother passed away. It took over a year. It was a long and drawn-out period. Painful. In recent months, we have lived with her and looked after her. After that, the lifestyle completely changed. Parties, travel, strange hotel rooms. I felt that I was becoming unhappy, that I missed my old life, but I did everything possible not to show it. Sharon began going to the gym regularly, fighting a losing battle against the ravages of time. She began to disappear more and more often, and one fine day, I felt a nagging suspicion. Almost ten years have passed, I am already fifty-eight, and I no longer have the same masculinity. One day, Sharon convinced me that she needed plastic surgery, and I finally reluctantly agreed. The results were amazing. After a few months, her breasts were high and firm again, and her face looked like she was in her early thirties. One day, I looked in the mirror and realized that I looked at least twenty years older. Twenty years? I was kind to myself. This explained why we now seem to be moving in different directions. One day I took a taxi and went to her gym just out of curiosity. She wasn't there. I looked into the pool and into the main hall. No trace. I was just about to ask someone when the door opened and she came out. The man standing directly behind her was tall and dark and had clearly spent a lot of time training. She smiled, then turned around, stood on her tiptoes and kissed him. His hand reached out and stroked her waist. The smile left her face as she turned away from him running her fingers over his chest and noticed me. She just stood there in surprise and of course couldn't say anything. I turned and walked out the front door. That evening she didn't come home. She never came home again. Life is full of temptations, it seems. After that there was a whirlwind of bars, gambling, drinking. The years passed, but not in vain. The times we spent together were good, they were just tinged with sadness. Six months after the divorce, I discovered that the contract check was two weeks late. I called and a woman answered the phone. She claimed that the check was already in the mail. The next month, he still had not arrived. I contacted a lawyer and began collection proceedings. When I pulled into the resort's parking lot, it was empty. It took me a while to realize that there was chaos here. In the carefully fenced-off parking spaces, Grass grew around the posts, and several pine logs were knocked off their supports. Scraps of paper and rubbish lay everywhere. The inside wasn't much better, with the main cottage looking faded and dirty. The outer doors to the refrigerator hung precariously on one hinget. There was an elderly woman sitting behind the bar. There was no one else there. I looked around and saw a row of video poker machinese. What do you need, buddy? She asked. Is management here? No, they rarely come. Is there anything I can do? No, everything is okay. I turned and left. I already knew what the problem was, and I knew what the result would be. 
Three months later, the legal part was completed. I picked up the keys from the lawyer's office, got into the old Impala that I had stored, and drove there. After looking around, I moved into the old main apartment and started working there. A couple came looking for work. I hired them and tasked them with mowing the grass and cleaning the rented premises. I cleaned up the main cottage myself, which took two full months. There were a few guests, but not many. Then, once the restaurant was back in business, things slowly started to improve. By that time, I had about 300000 in my pocket. The government came and removed the video poker machines. I can't say I was very concerned about that. Things like that just didn't fit into what this place was supposed to be like. The day the old station wagon pulled up to the house and I saw Carlos and Maria get out was something of a beginning for me. They were, of course, looking for work. There were a few moments of discomfort, but they were great employees, so I hired them again. Maria asked me if anything would be different. I understood what she meant. Do your job. Everything will be fine, I told her. He also told her that she now has the evening shift. At this, she grinned. Within a few weeks, she got the bar singing, and the place was profitable again. I hired an elderly woman to work in the kitchen. She was just a magician there. Now I could do what I've always done best, wander around the neighborhood and look for things to fix. One day, Carlos and I were transporting lumber from a trailer into one of the storage sheds. He asked about Sharon. Strangely, I didn't think much about her. I was too busy. Being busy was my best asset. It meant no time to think. She's fine, I think. I'm not sure where she is now. Well, I'm sorry that happened, boss. You two always seem to get along great. I was very surprised the day she... He saw the expression on my face and stopped. Now you better tell me, I said. It was a long time ago, boss. That day when she and that Karen woman were sunbathing, that evening she came to our house. She looked... It was one of those things. I couldn't say no. I'm sorry. I hope this didn't cause any trouble. I simply nodded. It's strange, but deep down I already knew. And somehow it didn't matter. I slept with Maria, his wife, and now that didn't matter either. Let's get this over with, I said, reaching for another board. October 24th was my birthday. I took the day off and just sat around. Winter was coming quickly. We had already had one small snowfall, which did not last long. I sipped my red wine and then, bored, wandered into the break room to see what was going on. Maria was sitting at the end of the bar talking to a woman. There was no one else in this place. I walked over and sat down. Hello, Maria. Quiet today, right? Yes, it was quiet. Look who's here. She smiled at me. I looked at the woman sitting there, long, dark hair, well-dressed. And then it dawned on me. Karen. She looked different? Older? But almost 15 years have passed since then. Hi, Dan. She smiled. Her soft voice caused the same almost forgotten trembling in me. Hello, Karen. What are you doing here? I said. I just wanted to come in and look at the old place. I came here five or six years ago, but things have changed a lot. No one could tell me where you were, so I just moved on. I heard that you and Sharon broke up. I would never have believed it. I think we just took different paths. Are you married? There was, but it lasted only three months. It seems I have no luck with men. I used to think that I was doing well with women, but now I'm surprised. Danny, did that really happen? She suddenly asked. I noticed that Maria had moved to the other end of the bar. What really happened? You and me. For several weeks, I was the happiest I've ever been in my life. I wanted the snow to stay there forever. I think I was happy, too. I know it sounds weird, but I didn't even feel guilty until... Of course I didn't feel it! She smiled cheerfully. We sat and sipped our drinks for a long time, both thinking. Tell me, do you have a room for the night? I don't want to go to the city. Or maybe you will stay with me? I asked her. I think I would like it. A lot. I looked down at Maria. If she had leaned any further, she would have fallen. You can lock yourself, okay? I told her. Of course, Dan. Then she smiled widely. I stood up and extended my hand. Karen reached out and took it. Hand in hand, we walked down the corridor to my room. 
I've gotten older, and a lot of time has passed, I whispered to her. Me too, but I'm sure we can handle it, she giggled. In my room, I looked out the window. It was snowing lightly. I looked at Karen. She was already naked. This was not a surprise. Wonderful. The world was getting better again. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.